opportunities and challenges of citizen science. So I'm going to touch on some of the things that Carenza has talked about and, and raise a few other points as well. So I suppose the upshot and the great selling point for Norman Conquest is that people just love conquests and invasions. But I would clarify that by saying, so long as they happened quite a long time ago. You know, so if it's about a thousand years ago, we're all good. You know, people love it. I looked on the the websites, and this is uh, some of the discussion at the bottom of Richard's project, um, where you've got so many people tracing their ancestry back to all of the people who came over with the Norman Conquest, the guy at the bottom. I'm 93% Scandinavian, I don't, I'm a direct descendant of Harold de Vaux, blah, blah, blah. They've had their DNA done, um, and they're, they're all saying that they share the same why DNA is Rollo and William the Conqueror. You know, there's huge appetite for going off and demonstrating that you're somehow linked to some of the, the lords that came over. I think the really interesting thing is, of course, you have to pay for this stuff. Um, and therefore, I think when you read some of the, the, the comments on this stuff, I've just got a feeling that it's kind of the people who would be voting for Brexit who are actually paying to demonstrate that they were part of the people who came over. I don't know, it's very, very complicated. But um, this is the sort of sub sites that you can go to. Pay your own money, get a little swab, it sends you back some stats. I'll talk more about this uh, in a minute. Um, this is something you can do off your own back, but there are lots and lots of projects uh, that have been conducted in the UK where People will be recruited if you can demonstrate that you've got like four generations of ancestors who've lived in roughly the same place and you've got the right surname. They'll take a DNA swab and you can start. This has just been published by Oxford, their Welcome Centre for Human Genetics, and there's a big um, museum display all about it, showing how all of the different groups in the UK really tracing their ancestry back to 1880 can be linked into all of these sorts of things. Great project, right? Really, really interesting. Lovely museum display. So on the same basis as this, that there are lots of other projects that have been trying to, to look at the genetic makeup of different regions of Britain, Europe, everywhere. Richard's project was linked into um, a Labertine-funded project looking at diasporas, particularly in the Viking Age. And they decided that they would do the same sort of thing, but focusing particularly on Normandy. Uh, so Richard is a fluent French speaker, went over and recruited lots of individuals. They did all of the same sort of projects um, or analyses that were done in the UK, where you find people with the right surnames, living in villages that look as though they have Norman or Scandinavian elements, check that those individuals can be traced back for generations to suggest that um, they have been living in that region for a while and they put out a call, you know, have you got making blood? Do you want to be part of this project? And loads of people did. I'm not going to click on this because the Wi-Fi isn't good enough. There's just a one minute video, it's in French, but you would get to see Richard talking about, yes, this project is amazing and all of these guys spitting into tubes. Um, so that they, they were all so excited because they wanted to find out whether or not they were Vikings. Um, got lots and lots of uh, publicity. Everybody was terribly excited, um, except it wasn't so great in France. And as kind of Carenza was talking about, you need to know your audience and you need to know what sort of cultural situation you're dealing with. Because as soon as the word got out about this project, and already it had recruited a lot of individuals who wanted to have their DNA done, um, it started actually being um, hijacked by the far left who saw this as an attempt by UK academics to go over and stir up xenophobia by suggesting that there could be something which makes you a true Norman or a false Norman, um, and it was highly, highly political. The reason that I know enough about this is because it got very, very bad, and a lot of wine was drunk between me and Richard, because for a while, there was a moment that we thought that he was going to be arrested and uh, fined thousands of pounds and incarcerated, because it turns out this is against the French constitution to do these kind of studies, um, because in French law, you are not allowed to be anything other than French. Paternity tests are not allowed in France. You cannot get your DNA tested because it's suggesting that you are something other than French. So this was a complete nightmare and all of the ethics had to be called out and law, legal people brought into to place in order to make sure that 
all of the results were anonymized and all the people who had signed up to get their results back were never allowed them back. So it was all a bit of a complete disaster in terms of how citizen science could go. But there are really good reasons why this happened because if you look at what has happened in Britain, a lot of these sorts of results are being hijacked by the far right. This is something that Richard um, gave me. It was taken from the National Front's website um, after they got their funding to look at the roots of the British. Um, and it was suggesting that actually, you know, on the one hand, this was going to be a great thing because it was going to be able to demonstrate who was really English and who wasn't. But on the other hand, they were also suggesting that it was terrible because it was going to suggest that they'd be... I don't know, it was going to suggest that somehow there was no such thing as a true British person. So as Corinza was saying, this stuff is dangerous and you need to know what you're getting into when you're doing it. And I think that's probably one of the big problems because most of the people who are doing this research are hardcore scientists, right? All of that study um, from the Wellcome Trust Centre for Genomics um, was done by hardcore scientists. These are not people who work in culture. Um, and that's why we start to see things like this um, to the right, which are things that are picked up in the news, which then start to draw circles and lines around modern genetics and start suggesting that this is linked into some sort of ancient tribal system. So here, this I think was um, all over the place. This is in nature. It got put into the times. It was just absolutely everywhere where people were saying, okay, this is the genetic results. Now let's show how nothing has changed over the last few millennia. And, okay, it's all nonsense. I want to bring this one back because everything about this ancestry DNA is, on the one hand, both like hugely fascinating and just equally completely meaningless, right? You'll send off your swab, it'll give you these stats. This is the guy on the advert who's like, this is the moment I found out I was a Viking. Ha ha ha, I thought I was from the Caribbean. And it's like, oh my God, like none of this is true. And I want to give you an example of how this is problematic. And this is where I'm gonna shift over onto my work. So. Um, I'm going to use the example of, of fallow deer, which is one of the animals that I've been looking at, to consider what do we actually mean when we're talking about native anyway. So in the terms of fallow deer, and I would say with humans as well, we were all quite widespread um, up until the last glacial period when a big lump of ice landed on top of us and everything ran away into its glacial refugia. So this is um, what we thought was the, the fallow deer's glacial refugia, but... Um, there have been arguments that there are actually three. With a lot of mammal species, again, all based on modern DNA, they'll say there are three glacial refugia. You've got Turkey, you've got one in Italy, and you've got one in Iberia. Last year, we published a paper, my project published a paper based on modern genetics. Um, on the left, you've got microsatellite showing a structure program. Um, on the right, that's kind of the results. On the basis of modern genetics, this paper argues, I don't buy any of it, um, but I'm on it, um, that there are three glacial refugia of fallow deer. Turkey, another one in Iberia, and another one in Italy, okay? Say the same arguments, Iberia, Turkey, Italy. Except this is all based on modern genetics, which are completely meaningless. What's your time depth on modern genetics? Two weeks ago, right? We can start to prove this because we've also done the ancient DNA. So this is the genetic network that my colleague Karis did. And I'm just going to, I'm not a geneticist, but I'll show you the results in terms of deer that are colored, different colors, according to the different kinds of genetic makeup that they have. So we've got the purple one down the bottom right. That's the Persian fallow deer. I'm not so interested in that one. Um, and then we've got these blue ones, the Turkish ones. These are what we thought were the last glacial refugia. Um, when it comes to the Neolithic, we start to see Persian fallow deer and European fallow deer, these ones here, um, starting to be hopped across onto islands. Um, except, of course, these red ones that we're starting to see spread are not the blue ones. Um, that's because the red ones are coming from a different glacial refuge, which is now extinct, completely extinct, so you wouldn't find it in the modern genetics. <laughs> We see, at the same time, iconographic evidence for the presence of these fallow deer starting to appear on islands. So, for instance, this is from Crete. We've got um, fallow deer. They appear to be domesticated, being led to an altar. Um, we also start to see them represented in iconography around the Bronze Age, around the time that they're turning up. 
And moving on uh, to other kinds of iconography, we could actually have told you on the basis of iconography alone that there was another glacial refugia in the Balkans because we've got all of these fallow deer, um, beautiful writer that are appearing in that area. It looks as though it's a center that's dedicated to Artemis and Diana. We've even got uh, this one here uh, is inscribed in Aramaic to uh, Artemis. So it looks as though the spread of fallow deer is associated with the spread of these religious beliefs associated maybe with the cult of Artemis in the first instance, but then later um, with the spread of the cult of Diana because into the Roman period we see um, fallow deer being taken absolutely everywhere across northern Europe. Some of the Persian ones make it to the Balearics, which is really, really fascinating, these just revealing trade routes. But we also start to see then again depictions of the goddess Diana represented with fallow deer there. What then happens, and this is the genetics for Britain, is that there is an extinction of those Roman fallow deer. They go completely extinct and they're replaced with a new population around, it's actually before the Norman conquest. So everything that I've ever written about fallow deer being spread around by the Normans, that they're a Norman introduction from Sicily, is all wrong um, conclusively. Uh, everything I've written is wrong. Um, but it comes in just before. So it's not a Norman introduction and it's not from Sicily because this is what happens. All of the fallow deer in Northern Europe get to extinction. They're replaced by these yellow ones. The yellow ones then spread to Ireland, Anglo-Norman Ireland, um, and then across the channel again. And those guys are coming from Turkey as well in the Eastern Mediterranean. And of course, their arrival, we can see that being linked into the spread of Byzantine parks and then uh, an increase in parks with, for, for women in particular. So again, that iconographic evidence is really, really useful for us. As much as the genetics in many ways, we could probably dispense with the genetics, just looked at the iconography and got a really um, good set of results and interpretations. So that's where I'm kind of going to move on to the side of the project which I've been talking about with regards to citizen science is that just a few weeks ago, we launched an app and I thought um, flyers for it. Um, I'm quite interested to talk to, to James about it as well um, because it's an app that you can just download onto your phone and you can record animals in architecture, in iconography, um, in portable antiquities as well um, so that we can start to build up actual data that we can start to think about say the movement of animals, because it's all linked into policy as well. Um, and we can start to do all sorts of things. So this is a behind the scenes look of the sorts of things that we can do. Since we launched the app, um, I've been able to go and see who's using it. And there's one guy or person um, who is living in the Oxford region who every weekend goes out and like records all of the animals in his churches in the local region, puts in the date and all of these sorts of things. And I was just realizing the, the more uh, that we've been using this app, the more applicable it is to so many different research projects. And it could easily be used for a Norman project as well, because um, you know, we see the introduction and the emergence of a lot more animals in architecture, particularly in Norman period. This is uh, Kilpeck, where we put the lovely um, hounds and, and the hare. So I should say that this app is actually linked to a project that we're, we're looking at the origins of Easter and rabbits and um, hares. So that's why we've been focusing on this site as well. But you could see all sorts of interesting things and perhaps start to chart the cultural context in which these animals are being represented. Because all it might give us a clue about when they're being introduced. The brown hair is, is not native. Um, and also perhaps what their cultural meaning is at that time. So just bring this to conclusion because I know that we are short for time. Uh, this is timely, right? The Norman Conquest is timely, whether it's in political terms, cultural terms, in its social relevance as well. Um, it's also quite dangerous because the sorts of things that we're looking at, particularly with uh, genetics, are, are so open to distortion and to be taken on and corrupted and used for political ends, as, as Karenz has already said. And whilst that is dangerous, I think it's also a real strength of what the Norman period has to offer to actually counter these really naive narratives of, of, that we're seeing reproduced in the press. Um, at the same time, this stuff actually has the potential to feed into wildlife policy. I was at the Mammal Society conference over the weekend, and in much the same way as 
human geneticists are not working in a cultural context. The same is true for people working in animal conservation. They base all of their stuff on modern genetics. It's all nonsense. And they need to realize that animals are not moving themselves, right? They're being taken by people for reasons. Um, and, and it's that cultural stuff that we need to understand. And the things that get conserved or, or considered as invasive species, it's all the same stuff that we see linked into modern migration narratives as well. But so long as they happened a long time ago, we're all cool with them. The more recent they are, whether they're animal introductions or human introductions, the more we kind of feel a bit uneasy and kind of uh, want to get rid of them. So I think that wildlife management and, and human studies of DNA are, are, are really, really similar. Um, I think that we need to think also about where the value of citizen science is. So with Richard's projects, he was kind of seeing humans as, as objects of research, that you could take some saliva or pluck a hair and, and, and get DNA samples. So they're actually sampling humans. Whereas I think I would prefer to see our project as using humans as agents for research. And I think that's where the difference is, to be able to get people engaged and doing something that's going to be useful. Somebody was talking about how apps don't work within museums. I think that's probably true. But if we can use them for actual research where people feel that they're contributing to something, they're more likely to get involved. Um, and all of this really has just been uh, me trying to advertise that we should all download the app and use it for whatever you can, whether it's for animal research, whether it's for portable antiquities, uh, or whether it's for studying the Norman Conquest. I'm sure there must be ways that we can use it cleverly. It's there. So we might as well use it. So um, you can download it from the store. You just type in like animal app and, and it will appear. I really want to see um, church communities using it more because they're such great um, animals in the architecture. So maybe I could give you some of these and you could distribute them. Okay, thank you. <laughs>